So Paul, changing the size of the sun, the shrinking sun, through changing essentially gravitational energy and potential energy, gives us a couple of million, maybe a 10 million years. So it actually may work, right? So. Yep, and in fact, uh, this is actually what's thought to happen with most stars when they're very young. Yep. They power themselves by shrinkage. Our own sun did this for about 10 million years back when it's early formed. But is it the only energy source for the sun? This was a great controversy in the late 19th century because the physicist led by Lord Kelvin, who was a very impressive and smart guy. <laughs> You're called Lord and you have a temperature scale <laughs> name after you, I guess. You've got a bit of kudos yeah. here. And he was saying that, yeah, we could only power the Earth, the sun, for... 10 million years or so and they could also do a similar calculation for the earth okay. we know that if you go down in a mine on the earth it gets hot yep so we know the inside of the earth is much hotter than the outside that's why lava comes up in yep. volcanoes now again maybe he thought the earth started off very hot and it's just been cooling down mm -hmm. and you could work out you can measure how rapidly the heat leaks out from the earth and work out how long ago the earth would have must have been entirely molten yep. to have cooled down as much as we see today and what do you get? About 10 million years ago. Wait, so, so if the sun shrinks, we get about 10 million years. If we figure out how the Earth cooled from a very hot ball, which kind of makes sense, you get the same answer. So it, we're assuming here that the sun and the Earth formed about the same time. And the sun has been shrinking ever since. And the Earth has been leaking heat out ever since. And they both come out about you know, 10, maybe 20, something like that, millions of but not 100 million years. Not 100 million years, but 10 million years. And the answer is the same, right? So problem solved. Yes, so of course the physicists and astronomers are very happy if you've done two different calculations and got the same answer. It must be true, right? I mean, we've, we've seen enough of these cases in cosmology. Um, but those pesky geologists, people who studied rocks, disagreed. What do rocks have to do with it? I mean, they, they, they were way down the status list compared to the physicists. Um, I actually minored in geology and geophysics, so I kind of regard myself as an honorary geologist. Um, now, what they were doing was looking at sedimentary rocks okay. now sedimentary rocks like these ones here i think this is in uh, utah on the united states in this picture um, are normally laid down um, by some form of erosion okay so the idea might be that you get a mountain range and rain falls on it and it gets chemically weathered and broken down and things get washed down and they may get washed onto a flood plain yep or they might get washed out to sea at a delta or they might get blown around by the wind and all these things get washed down and deposited in layers. Okay. And slowly over time, one layer after another is laid down, whether it's on a floodplain or under in a lake or in the sea. But this is happening today. We can see it happening. Okay. Here, for example, is the mouth of the Amazon. And so this is kind of these layers of sediment kind of being shoved into the, or pushed into the ocean. And some parts of the Amazon, like some branches, have very little sediment because they're just coming from rainforest. But yep. other parts that come from mountains, um, mud can get washed into yep. the river and carried out to sea and then it will settle somewhere out in the ocean. So well, how long does this process take? Well you can measure how rapidly the sediment gets deposited now. So you okay. can go and measure how thick the sediment is and come back 10 years later and see how much thicker it's got. Yep. And typically it's at most sort of millimetres per year. Not a lot. But you know, give it enough time, you can deposit very yeah, thick layers. I mean, it's, uh, it's not very much any, any given time. The trouble is, the layers of sedimentary rock are very, very thick. I love the Grand Canyon in snow. And I, and I guess this is a good point, right? I mean, the Grand Canyon is pretty big. That's why it's called the Grand Canyon. And there's a lot of layers that you can see. And each of these layers was laid down as some form of sediment. So you would have had some layer of silt deposited in a delta or a lake or a shallow sea and then another layer, another layer over many, many years and it got built up. So you have these small millimetres, small millimetres, small millimetres, small millimetres. It's going to take a lot of small millimetres to build something this thick. Yeah. And that's not the half of it because what generally happens is you get these layers built up yep. and then some new volcano moves, they all get tilted over, they often get buried, something's get eroded away and then a new layer gets deposited on top of them. So you're saying it's not even just simple as counting the layers like tree rings, there's actually more structure that we have to Because the layers at the top of the Grand Canyon are not recent. That's true. They, they were not laid down last year, they were laid down millions of years ago because right now it's high in the northern Colorado and That's it's right. not being deposited, it's being eroded. Yep. So presumably at some point in the past this was under an ocean and getting deposited and it's been raised up and eroded since then. Okay. But what you can do is you can look at, for example, here down at the coast near Canberra, this is near Batemans Bay, you can see a whole bunch of these deposits which are now at an angle. So this is something, you know, one of these deposits has shifted or changed and now uh, 
in the past these layers were being formed, it's just when and how long. Yeah, so these layers would have been laid down, I think these were laid down in a shallow sea at some point, yep. and you would have had layers of floods coming out. Every time a flood came down from the mountains, it would lay down another millimetre, and then another millimetre, and that slowly built up over time, and they yep. got buried many kilometres under other rocks, solidified into rocks, and at some point subsequently had been tilted around and squashed up to the surface again. Okay. And the geologists could add this all up. That you can't find any one place on Earth where all the layers are on top of each other, uh -huh. but you can find a bunch of layers in one place and then they've got eroded and then another layer that overlaps with it and another layer. You can match different layers by seeing they have the same sorts of fossils in them. Yep. Um, and uh, that's what I did as a <laughs> pre-university. I was looking at microfossils to date rocks in the North Sea. And by adding these all together, they could work out an age. And the age for a lot of the rocks was definitely coming out in at least the hundreds of millions of years. So that's a lot longer than the 10 or so millions of years. But OK, all right, hold on, Paul. So if you're saying that these come from washing out rain, what if you had three massive big storms? What if you had this gigantic flood? What if you had two gigantic floods or three? Yeah, so this is all based on the assumption that these things are being laid down in the past at about the same rate they're being laid down now. It's it called the uniform materium. But maybe a lot of people at the time were saying, uh, because they wanted to support the idea of the biblical age of the earth being much younger. Mm. And they said maybe you had massive floods in the past. Instead of depositing a millimetre a year, you deposited a metre a year. Yeah, and a metre a year, that's obviously a thousand times faster, a so, thousand times less. That's right. Now, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, nowadays we have radioactive dating, which allows us to work out that this is not true. But even then, it really didn't make sense things were deposited that fast. You look at these layers, mm -hmm. and you see they're also very, very fine layers like a layer that might only be a millimetre of, and then a layer of a different composition, another millimetre thick. And that presumably meant you've got a flood coming in from one area and then a flood coming in from another area. One might deposit mud, one might deposit sand. Mm. And each layer is very thin. And when it first laid down, it would have been very fragile. If there'd been a huge storm, it would have churned it all up. You can't wash metres worth of stuff down without churning up these very thin layers of mud. Okay. In fact, things like silt have to be deposited in a very gentle environment. You get very fine particles slowly sinking to the bottom. If you have wild storms, it's going to get churned up. You're not going to get these very fine layers. But, well, maybe storms have changed. Maybe, is there anything else that would say that's not the case? Maybe the climate has changed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's also you can see that, for example, you get ripple marks in the surface of one layer, uh -huh. which meant that layer was deposited and then laid there long enough for like ripples to come. Sometimes you see dinosaur footprints or even human footprints on top of the layers. And so that meant that this layer was there and then something walked on it before the next layer was put down. So you're saying the geologists are not wrong. And then often you will see, for example, a layer is laid down and a plant grew from one into the next. Ah. That doesn't, it's not that you deposit 100 metres yeah, in one big okay, storm. Okay. It was very, very clear to the geologists that this is all a very, I mean, there, there are evidence of storms. You do find deposits yeah. where there's been some massive storm. Yep. But even a massive storm can't wash away more than all the topsoil. Yeah, okay, if yeah. you had the most massive storm <laughs> of all time, it might wash away all the topsoil in a thick layer. Yeah. But then you're going to be left with bare rock. Bare rock doesn't erode underwater. That's true. You need chemical chemicals to seep it and break it down again over thousands or millions of years to turn that rock back into topsoil mm. to wash it away. So really, I mean, sure, there have been catastrophes and we can see the evidence of them, but no matter how the geologists played with that data, they just couldn't see any way to make the age less than about 100 million years. Which is just so much longer than the measurements from both the Earth cooling and what we get from the sun. So clearly the physicists thought the geologists must be wrong. Obviously. And geologists were sort of a bit intimidated by these physicists, but they thought, well, I really, no matter how much I play with, I just can't make these ages square. So there's still something that has to be powering the sun, not it shrinking. In this case, it turned out it was the physicists and the astronomers, like our ancestors, who were wrong.